Hello, welcome to a new Unity Tutorials game series. This is part one of a new series, and this series will be making an underwater survival game like Subnautica. So for the first episode, we will be making a simple player controller and a simple stat system. In this project, we will be using free-to-use assets that can be found online. For today's episode, we will be installing a universal render pipeline that renders water, as well as a Mixamo model to act as our player character. Okay, so first things first, we need to open our package manager in order to install the water pipeline. I found Aquaslide on the Unity Asset Store for free, and we'll be using it in this project to render water so we just want to import everything into the project. Once everything has been loaded, you'll see that Aquaslide has its own folder and there's also a demo scene with water in it. So first and foremost, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it External Assets. And I'm going to put in the related folders in there. So this is the folder we will use to keep track of all our imported assets. In here, I'm also going to create a new folder. I'm going to call it Models. So now, I'm just going to import the Mixamo model. And then I'm going to extract the textures of this model. I'll just extract them into the same folder the model is in. And with that, the model should now be fully colored. So always remember to extract the textures for your mixable models. In this episode, we won't actually be covering how to create terrain. That will actually be handled in a future episode. For now, we are just going to use the terrain and the water from the demo scene of Aqua's Light in order to create our player controller and our simple stats system. Alright, so with that out of the way, I'm just going to select the terrain and the water plane, and I'm just going to copy them. I'm going to go to scenes, and I'm going to go into sample scene and paste them right here. As you can see, there's water now. So if you go to the water plane, um, it actually uses some materials to determine the color of the water. And if you select them, you can edit the colors to be um, to look more like you imagine. So I'm just making the water a lighter color. And um, for now, I'm only going to adjust the color of the water, but you can edit the settings as you like. So first order of business, I'm going to create a player character. So I'm just going to create a capsule and um, I'm going to reset its position to zero. Okay, with this capsule, I'm just going to put it on one of these mountains. So now we have our player controller. I'm going to name this game object player and then create a rigid body for it. For now, I'm going to disable gravity and we will enable it and disable it within the code to, for, in, for, the, for the sake of our movement. Alright, so now we have a player controller. Since Subnautica is a first person game, we will drag the camera to become a child of the player and then reset its position also. We also want to move the camera to be at eye level, so I'm just going to approximate it. Now I'm going to go to models and I'm going to drag the character model that we have to become a, a child of the player also. And yeah, for now he's just T posing because we haven't implemented any animations for him yet, but we will do that. We will do that in a future episode. So I'm just going to drag him to adjust him to be at the correct height for the cylinder. 
then I'm going to disable the mesh renderer so that we can see him now and lastly we move the camera to be at the eye level of a player character now we have a player character and he's looking at this hill fantastic I'm going to move him closer to the water. I'm going to rotate him to face the water so you can have a nice view. Alright, the next step is to create a script so that the, we can implement the player controller. So I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to name it scripts. And then within scripts, I'm going to create a folder called player. This is so we can keep our code organized in the future because there will be a lot of scripts. So in player, I'm going to create a new script and I'm going to name it player controller. Now we open up player controller in Visual Studio Code. To start off, I'm going to create a reference to the transform. This is because in scripts where the transform is referenced a lot, it is actually slightly faster to cache the transform. Of course, we'll want to assign it and start. Next thing, I'm going to create a header and we're going to call it player rotation. So remember when using headers, the variable directly beneath it needs to be a public variable, otherwise the header will not display in the inspector. So here I'm just going to do a public float sensitivity and I'm going to set the, its default value to 1. Afterward, we want to store the mouse input values. Alright, so in order for the player to look around, let's create a function called look around. In this function, we will first get the mouse input from the mouse x and mouse y axis. Then we will use those values to set the rotation of the player. Take note here that we use negative rotation y so that the player looks up when the mouse moves up and the player looks down when the mouse moves down. Otherwise, it will be inverted. Here, we are also using quaternion.euler in order to get the correct angle for the player to look towards. Here, we can also add the sensitivity variable so that when you adjust the sensitivity variable in the inspector, it will adjust how fast the mouse will swipe. So here, I'm just going to multiply the input values by sensitivity. The last thing we need is to call look around in the update function so that this code will run every frame. One more thing before we test. Usually when playing a first person game, your cursor is locked to the center of the screen. So in order to achieve that, it's actually very simple. In the start, I'm going to change the cursor lock state to cursor lock mode dot lock. This statement will cause our cursor to become conf to disappear as well as be confined to the center of the screen. I'm also going to create a quick debug function so that when you press escape, the cursor lock state becomes cursor lock mode dot none, which returns our mouse back to normal. This is just for convenience when we play test a game. Now, if we test this code. If we return back to the Unity, you can now drag the player controller onto the player game object. As you can see, the sensitivity is set to 1 by default. And if I click play, the player should be able to move around. It appears the player is floating right now, but that's just due to the fact that the rigid body has no gravity, and that'll be, we'll fix that later. Anyways, um, you can see we can look up and down, but we run into a problem. If you look all the way around, you can actually turn upside down and do a black flip. 
which is something that is not good. I'm going to press escape and I'm going to end the play break. And now we'll look at how to fix this bug in the, in the code. The next thing to do is to create variables so that we can set a maximum rotation for the Y rotation. This is because when the player is rotating, we want to prevent the Y rotation from going above a certain point and going below a certain point. While as for the X rotation, it's fine if they can rotate 360 degrees. Now if we go back to look around, we can use mathf.clamp to clamp the value of the Y rotation. And once again, if we return to our Unity scene, we can now input the values for rotation minimum and rotation maximum. I personally like to use negative 50 and 50, but you can use any value you like. Personally, I recommend, I recommend using between the using values between the negative 90 and the 90 range. Otherwise, it might be too much. So as you can see. As you can see, we now have a maximum rotation and a minimum rotation. Our next step is to add swimming movement. So in our game, we are going to have three types of movement. Movement on land, movement underwater, and movement while you're swimming along the top of the water. So first of all, I'm going to add the underwater swimming movement. So for our underwater swimming movement, there needs to be there are three vectors upon which we can move forward and backwards, left and right, as well as up and down. So our well, first things first, we're going to edit the input manager. So if we go to player settings and we go to input manager, you can see that we only have two axes of movement right now. So we need to add a third one. So X will remain our horizontal axis, which means it will move from left to right, and it's mapped to the keys A and D. Then the Z axis will be mapped to the keys S and W, which will move forward and backwards. So I'm going to rename this to the forward vector. So yeah, as you can see here, it uses the S and W keys to move forward or backwards. Now the third one, we need another axis, so I'm going to name this to become the vertical axis. This will be our Y axis. We'll be controlling the Y axis using the left shift and the space bar. With that out of the way, we have our three axes set up. Horizontal being X, forward being Z, and vertical being Y. Okay, so now we can go back to the script. And for, and for the sake of player movement, we're going to need another set of variables. So I'm going to create another header. We will have a public float speed. And I'm just going to set that default value to 1. And then we also have three floats to store the input axis of x, y, and z. So I'm going to create a new function. I'm going to call it move. First things first, we need to get the movement input. Remember to map the correct axis to the correct um, letter. Remember X is horizontal, Y is vertical, and Z is forward. Secondly, we want to move the character. So when underwater, we want the character to move forward based on the direction they're facing. So for X and Z, we will be moving based on their local rotation. However, for the Y movement, we want it to always be vertically up and down, no matter the orientation of the player. So we will not be using the local rotation. We will be using the t.translate function to move the player. And then we need to multiply it by time dot delta time and multiply it by speed. After that, we also need to move the player based on the Y input. So I'm going to copy this. T.translate automatically moves the player 
based on the local rotation of the player. However, if you use space.world, it will move the player based on the world space instead of the local rotation. The next thing to do is to put move in update. However, since move is a movement function and the player will be colliding with different colliders, I'm going to put move in fixed update. Fixed update is a version of update that is called at a fixed frame rate rather than a frame rate dependent on how well your computer is working. So this is also the same update that is used by colliders. That's why I'm using it to call the move function. So now we can try to test this out. I'm going to set the speed to 10. And with the gravity off, we should be able to move based on the direction and rotation we're facing, as well as travel up and down using space. So even if I'm, so when I press W, as you can see, I am gliding in the direction I'm facing. So if I wanted to go down, I would look down and press W. And I can also press shift and spacebar to go vertically up, regardless of the direction I'm facing. So that's our swimming movement. The next thing we need to do is to create a way for the player controller to differentiate between the three modes of movement. So the player controller needs to know whether it's on land and whether it's in water. And then when it's in water, it needs to know whether it's underneath the surface of the water or swimming along the surface of the water. So in order to do that, we need to set up the scene. So first of all, I'm going to select the terrain and I'm going to give it a tag, which I'm going to call ground. This will be useful in the future for when we need to detect whether the player is standing on the ground in order to do certain actions like jumping which will be in a future episode. So the next thing we need is a collider. I'm going to create an empty game object and set it to zero, and I'm going to name it Water Collider. For this game object, I'm going to make it a box collider, and I'm going to set the size to the height to 20, and the size to 200 by 200. If we take a look at it from the side view, you'll see that the water level is directly the same as the water plane level. So the water plane level and the water collider. So make sure that these two line up. So if we look at the water collider, it encompasses a really large area, and this is not good for optimization. So in a future episode, we will actually be looking at it to make sure that it becomes more optimized. But for now, we will just use this collider for the sake of creating our player controller. So it's a box collider now. We need to set it to its trigger, and I'm going to set its layer to water. So what we want to do is whenever the player uh, interacts with this water collider or touches it, it will t inform the player controller script that the player is in the inside water. And if it's not touching the collider, that means it is the player is out of water. So let's open up our script again to add it. I'm going to create some static bools to keep track of the player of what movement state the player is in. So the first one will be in water and the second one will be is swimming. In water returns true if the player is in water and returns false if the player is in land, which will help us decide whether to walk or not to walk. And then is swimming returns true when the player is swimming under the surface of the water and returns false when the, pl when the player's head is above the surface of the water. Okay, so the next step is to create a function that toggles the in-water bool. So I'm going to create a new function called switch movement. And this function will just swap in-water to not in-water. So whenever this is called, it swaps the in water to not out in water and 
in this function later on we can also put any um, other code that we need to do when swapping between in water movement and out out of water movement okay so since we have a trigger collider set up we're going to use on trigger enter and on trigger exit to call switch movement and in start we should set in water to false this is just to make sure that it's set properly for so that when the player starts the game they are out of water the next thing we need to do is to check if the player is swimming or floating so i'm also going to create another function to handle that i'm going to create the function swimming or floating and in this function we want to determine whether the player is swimming under the water or floating along the top of the water. So in order to determine this, we're going to do a ray cast. So this ray cast will check if the, there is a water collider, if the water collider is below the head of the player. So if the head of the player is above the water collider, the ray cast will return a distance. And if it's at a certain distance, then we can do the floating movement. And then if it does not return anything, that means the player is either um, outside of the water or underwater, so we can set is swimming to false. So I'm just going to create a temporary bool. By default, we want to return is swimming as false unless the ray cast hits something. So I'm setting this bool to false. We only need to know if the player is swimming when they're underwater, so I'm going to put another if statement here. Now to set up our ray cast. For our physics ray cast, we're going to take the position of the player, but uh, but slightly elevated so that it's referring to its head. Then we'll take vector three dot down so that the ray cast cast downwards. We're putting out the ray cast in head, and also the length of the ray cast will be math infinity. The last thing we need is a layer mask, so I'm just going to call this one water mask. And oh, back on top, I'm going to add another public variable. So now, whenever the player is in water, it will cast a physics raycast. And if the physics raycast returns true, we can use the value to determine whether to change swim check. If the hit distance is less than 0.1, we can set swim check to true. So. If the distance is less than 0.1, we can still count the player as swimming below the surface. And if the ray cast doesn't return at all, that means the player is definitely swimming below the surface. Finally, at the end of the function, we can set is swimming to swim check. I'm also going to do a debug.log so we can test this. Right, one more thing before we go back to Unity. We need to actually call swimming or floating in the fix update. Now, we also need to make sure swimming or floating is called before move, so that is swimming is updated correctly in that frame before we decide which movement to use. Now, if we try the Unity. So when we press play, you'll see is swimming is false, but if I go down into the water, it's swimming becomes true. And then as I raise my head above the water, it'll become false. Now it's true again. And it's false. So even though I'm still in water, it's become false because my head's above water. And then if I'm outside of the water completely, it returns false. Alright. Back to the script. Now that we have our two booleans that determine what kind of movement we're using, we can edit the move function to involve all three types of movement. First of all, we want to check if the player is on land, so if the player is not in water. Then, if the player is in water, we need to check if the player is swimming or not. And lastly, the swimming movement for the character. So I'm just going to copy and paste the movement code we made earlier. Now, first things first, the land version of character movement. 
In order to move the character on land, we'll actually need to activate the rigid body's gravity. So what we need to do now is to get a reference to the rigid body of the player. I'm going to go to player movement and I'm going to add a rigid body. Then in start, I'm going to get the component for the rigid body. Now, whenever we swap between in water and not in water, we need to set the rigid body's gravity to change. So I'm going to go to switch movement and we're going, just going to toggle the gravity of the rigid body. Okay, now we can finally get to the land movement. The problem with land movement is that if we do t.translate based on the local rotation, the player will be able to move diagonally upward and downward with the forward movement. However, if we use world space rotation, the player will only be able to move um, in the forward vector or the left vector based on world space, regardless of their rotation. So how I get around this is by multiplying the uh, the movement by in the world space by the rota rotation quaternion of the player. So with this, the movement on land is complete. If you like, you can set different speeds for movement on land as compared to the movement of water. You just need to add another variable. Okay, now for the floating movement. This part is going to be the hardest. So for the floating movement, we want to do movements similar to the swimming movement, except we need to make sure the character can't rise above the floating height. So we need to be able to clamp the absolute Y height of the player to make sure it doesn't increase beyond um, the current Y height. So how I'm going to do this is we're actually going to move the player based on world space so that we can we can create a vector that prevents the player from moving higher than mo increasing the y value. The first thing we need to do is to clamp the move y value so that the player can still use y to descend beneath the water but not to ascend above the water. The next step is to convert the local direction vector into a world space vector so that we can convert the x movement that's based on rotation to become world space movement. I'm going to create a temporary vector tree to hold this value. The next step is to clamp the values of this world space vector. Here we'll be using another mathf.min function. This makes, sure, this makes sure that when the player is looking upwards, they can't ascend beyond the height they already are, but if they're looking downwards, they'll dive downwards. After we clamp the values, then we can do, uh, then we can finally do the movement. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do t.translate clamp direction times time dot delta time times speed uh, based on the world space. Quick mistake here, I actually put move y instead of move z, which is supposed to be the uh, forward vector. With that, the movement is done. One more thing we need to do before we play test is set the water mask to water so that the raycast will detect if the player is above or below the water. Now we can test. So first off, we start off on land. So if we're standing still, we can still look around and um, there's no velocity. Then if we can move in the direction that we are facing, uh, side to side also, and if I press spacebar or shift, it doesn't work. Now, if I go and jump into the water, so now we are swimming and we can look out above the water.
and then we can also sink and when we're pressing space bar while at the top of the water we don't go up and neither do we go up we look up but if we look down or press shift we do go down so that's exactly how you want it to work and so back to swimming and then i can walk on land again and then swim again so yeah it all works properly now for the next part of this tutorial we are going to create a simple player stats system. So first of all, we need to create a player stats UI. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to create a canvas. I'm going to call this player canvas because this is the canvas we're going to use to display all of the player related things. So whenever I create a canvas, uh, you have to always make sure to put in the size correctly. I always do 1920 and 1080 by default. And another thing I like to do actually is to create a folder called presets. And then I'll actually save this setting as a preset. The scale with screen size 1920 by one. So I go to presets, I save my default canvas. And now whenever I want, I can select it and, it'll, and then I don't have to, and then it's actually slightly fast. You can do this with any component if you're going to be setting the values of something often. So yeah. For the, U, for the stats UI, we're going to be displaying the health, the oxygen level, the food level, and the water level. So I'm going to be creating them using sliders. So as you can see here, with an oxygen slider, it slides between the value of 0 and 1. However, there's a little gap here, which so we can adjust it by setting the right to 5 and that should perfectly cover the entire bar. So as you can see here, it goes from 0 to 1. However, we should set the max value of the oxygen to be 30 so that we can set it from 0 to 30. The next thing I'm going to do is to change the color of the fill. So I'm just going to go to the fill aspect and I'm going to change it to a green, blue, turquoise color. This will be our oxygen slider. Remember to always adjust the anchors of your UI. Lastly, we are going to add on some text to the side so you can see exactly what number your UI is at. So if I open up Text Mesh Pro, uh, we need to import it. And once we have, we can put it at the edge of this UI. So, we want the text to be centered but left aligned. And I'm just going to enter 30 here because that's how much oxygen you start off with in Subnautica. Now we can just duplicate this to create the other three stat bars. Using the vertical layout group, you can easily organize the stats to be correctly spaced. For now, we will just be using bars, but in a future episode when that's focused on UI, we can actually make these bars become the radial circles like you see in Subnautica. But for now, these should suffice just fine. So for health, we're going to set the maximum to 100 
and same thing for hunger and thirst actually. We set the default text to 100 for these as well. With that, our UI has been set up. The next thing we need to do is to start creating a, a script to control this UI. Okay, so if we go to scripts and then we create a new folder, I'm going to call it UI. And in this folder, we create a new script. We're going to call it player stats. And then we're going to open it and we're going to create some public list to store the stats. So for these stats, we just need to remember that 0 is oxygen, 1 is food, 2 is thirst, and 3 is health. So we're going to be setting the max stats in the inspector window later. So when we start the game, we want to initialize the current stats to the max amount. So I'm going to write and start. The next thing we need to do is to create a coroutine to decrease the stats, to decrease each stat every in set interval of time. So I'm going to create a new coroutine called decrease stats. It will take in a stat, the interval, and the amount decreased every time. So in this coroutine, I'm going to do a while, a while loop. We're going to yield return for each interval. Then we're going to set the current stat uh, to the correct amount. And here I'm just using a mathf.max function so that if the current stats minus the decrease amount is less than zero, it will just automatically set it to zero so that we won't have a negative number as a stat ever. So now that we have this coroutine, we, I'm just going to create ver coroutine variables to store the cor the one, one coroutine for each stat that we're decreasing. So we're going to be decreasing oxygen, food, and thirst. Uh, all the time. So let me just add the new variables. Then in start, I'm going to initialize the hunger and thirst coroutine. The oxygen coroutine is a little bit complicated, so we'll just do these two first. So here, I'm going to decrease the first stat, which is food, by 1 every 20 seconds. And I'm going to do the same thing for thirst. Now we can do oxygen control. So when it comes to controlling the oxygen, we want the oxygen to decrease while the player's head is underwater and to remain reset back to the maximum when the player is on land or floating with the head above the water. But first, let's create the function that refreshes a stat. So this function, we're going to call it change stat. It'll allow us to change the value of a stat by, an, by, a certain, by an amount when called. This will be the function we use to refresh the oxygen whenever the player comes up for air. So I'm going to create the function now. This function will check if the refresh amount is more than zero or less than zero. And if it's more than zero, it adds it to the current stat and makes sure it doesn't go over the maximum. And if it's less than zero, it reduce, it takes it away from the current stat and makes sure it doesn't go let to become a negative number. Now to control the oxygen decrease of the player. So for the oxygen stat, we want it to decrease whenever the player's head is under the water and we want it to remain at 30 and refresh whenever the player comes out of the water. So the bull to check is the is swimming static bull from player controller because is swimming is only true when the player's head is underwater and when it's false, the player's either floating with the head above the water or walking. So I'm going to do two if statements here. 
So as you can see here, if the player isn't swimming, we stop the coroutine that decreases the oxygen, and we refresh the oxygen. And then if the player is swimming, we start the coroutine that decreases the oxygen. However, there's a problem with this code. Because this code is run an update, it's going to run every single, so every single update, the player controller is going to return is swimming or not swimming, and this, this code is going to run over and over and over again. Twi we only want to run this code during two scenarios, when the player controller comes out of the water and when the player controller enters the water, and not while they've been in the water the whole time. So in order, so to explain more clearly, let's just make the code. First things first, I'm going to add my own local bool in order to check what the previous frame was. So if I go over here, I can add a new bool. And then um, here's what I'm going to do. So what happens here is swim track only turns false when the player stops after the player has stopped swimming. And then swim track only turns true when the player has started swimming. And then these bulls only check for the one frame where the player is currently not swimming but was swimming the previous frame. So now uh, we, go, we can test it out. So uh, for the sake of testing it out, I'm just going to make the current stats class to be public. We'll change it back after we finish testing. So if we go to our Unity and we click on player, we can now drag the player stats script to become a component of the player game object. And here you can see we have a max stats and current stats. So for max stats, I'm going to add in all the stats. So 30 for oxygen, 100 for hunger, 100 for thirst, and 100 for health. Now when I click play, we should be able to see the current stats. So the current stats list gets initialized from the max stats. And um, if we go under the water and wait for three seconds, we should see that the, um, the, the oxygen stat is actually decreasing. So now it's 21. And then if I go above the water, it resets to 30. And if I go back under the water, it goes to 27. And it continues to be increasing. So this shows that our code is only running once. Now, if we actually go from water to land, it also resets properly, so that works. And as you can see, at the same time, if you notice that our hunger and thirst stats are also going down slowly every 20 seconds. If 20 seconds is too fast, you can also just, uh, change the interval yourself in your code, and yeah, adjust it as you see fit. Now, now that we know that the stat system is working, we're going to connect it to the UI. So what we need to do is open up player stats again, and we need to use we need to use Unity Engine UI and Text Mesh Pros. Now in our variables, we want to add the UI variable. So I'm going to add another header. We're going to create a list of the sliders and a list of the Text Mesh Pro GUIs. So we'll call the sliders stat bars and we'll call the TextMesh Pro stat nums. You should also note that sliders are a Unity Engine UI uh, component. So that's why we had to add it in here. Now, the first thing we're going to do is to initialize the stat bars because Unity sliders by default have a minimum value of zero and a maximum value of one. However, we want our sliders maximum value to reflect the max stats value. So I'm going to go to start and I'm going to add a few lines of code. We're going to use a for loop to loop through every single stat and to set the stat bars maximum values accordingly. So now when we set the stat bar values, we don't have to divide it by um, the maximum stat. We can just set the value as the current stat value. Moving on to update, now we're going to actually display our stat values to the UI. So we're going to use another for loop. So in this for loop, we'll just set the stat bar and the stat nums.
Oh yeah, one last thing. Don't forget to make this lid private again. So now we can return to Unity and return to the player. So as you can see here, we have the UI and the stat nums. So now I can take each stat. So if I open up stat holder, I can take each stat. Ox remember the order, oxygen, food, thirst, and health. And then I can do the same with the text. Oxygen, food, thirst, and health. So now if we run this, we should see the stats decreasing based on our current stats. So I'm going to click play. I'm going to jump into the water and see if the sliders decrease. Oh, yeah. So you see uh, in the corner, we have 27, 24, and the slider is also decreasing along with it. So with that said and done, that's it for today's episode. We've created a basic movement system and we've also created a basic stat system for our player. Tune in for the next episode when it comes out. Like and subscribe and thank you for supporting our channel.